Great day for ducks, and I guess that's not the people, but we do need rain. We can't live without water, so anyways, uh, as I said, I have a new Bible, but the good thing is the words are large enough that I can read them, and I've been trying to put notes in. It'll take me like 15 years to put all my notes in, but, but we're good. But anyways, this church exists because of what we understand in the Word of God, and if there's someone that does listen to this message, maybe they will see it. Maybe they will not even want to see it if they're involved in some denomination or some kind of tradition. But we're here because we understand that we have an apostle, and we have one apostle. We don't have 12. And why was it necessary for God to have a 13th apostle? Because He's the apostle of grace. And we, I've mentioned in the past so many things. In all of the rest of the Bible, in the King James Bible, there might be Hebrew words that could have been translated different ways that could have been great. But you have grace 67 times in all the rest of the Bible. In Paul's epistles, the word grace is mentioned 89 times. So that's why I say he is the apostle of grace. Has there always been grace? Absolutely. No one can be saved without grace. But Paul is distinct in saying, I have, and I'm divided this, and this is what we're going to do for the next, well, however many weeks, to look at five aspects of this wonderful grace. First of all, Paul's the only one that says, I have been given the dispensation of grace. He's the only one that says, talks about the preaching of the cross. It's Paul emphasizes more than any other writer a believer's walk. He doesn't just leave us there. The third thing, he makes oaths or vows. I swear, I'm a witness, God is my witness, and so forth. No other writer says that, and we'll explain why. And the fifth thing, Paul's always talking about his conscience, how important that was to him. He had a good conscience before men and before God. So these are the five aspects that I would like to look at. And in this, we're going to look at those broad aspects, and that's what I call these five, and the great truths which was commissioned to Paul to unfold. Now, was grace mentioned? Absolutely. So let's look at the first time. Go to Genesis. And sometimes I will read, and sometimes I like to ask other people to read because I think it keeps you involved, which I like to do when I was in the classroom, to keep kids involved by having them do things and not just me talking. So in, Ge in Genesis chapter 6 and first eight, uh, verse 8 is the first time you see the word grace in all of God's word. And it's a wonderful verse. So let's look at that, Genesis 6 a. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now in our King James Bible, Grace is mentioned 37 times in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, and I realize when I say Genesis to them, actually the Old Testament doesn't start till Moses, but in most eyes, it's Genesis to Malachi. 37 times the word grace is mentioned. But what is amazing about it, different than Paul's epistles, almost every time Paul talks about grace, he's talking about grace in the idea of salvation and God's rule in that salvation. Many times, grace is mentioned in the Old Testament or even in, in the Gospels, where it's only mentioned five times. It says the only time it's used in Luke, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is when it says Christ grew in grace and wisdom. Nothing about grace as part of salvation. So in Genesis 6, 8 is the first time you see God saying that somebody found grace. Let's look at that. It's talking about Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So that's actually a true statement, and what a wonderful thing that he found that grace, and God used him. It's amazing when you go all the way then to the book of Psalms, is one of the first times you see grace talked about again. Go to Psalms 31. Or, wait, 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 I'm sorry. See what I'm saying when I have a new Bible? I think it's Psalms 84, so I apologize. Absolutely. I'm not as old as I look. Okay. <laughs> In Psalms chapter 84, 
And this is wonderful. Look at this verse, please. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord... Oh, I'm sorry. Verse uh, 11. Thank you. Keep me on my toes, please. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will be withheld from them that walk upright. And of course, we know he's talking about Israel there. So it is true that God gave grace. And it says, the Lord will give grace and glory. And here he's given it to a nation, to a spe specific people. We also see that if we go to Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah 31... Again, talking to about Israel. So there are verses where it talks about God giving his grace to people. But a lot of times it's talking about this man to man. But here is a wonderful verse that Israel should have understood and hopefully would have understood. Jeremiah 31 and look at verse 2. Bob, would you read that please? So God had said constantly to Israel, I'm the only one that can give you rest. And the problem with Israel was that they were constantly rebelling. No matter how, God, how good God was to them, I can't comprehend, that's just me. But I'd have probably been just like them because I know in my flesh is no good thing. But they saw God destroy the whole nation of Israel. They saw all the plagues that he put on Israel that wasn't given to them. He saw them divide the Red Sea and let them walk through dry. It's amazed. The people who were killed were immersed. Just a little thought about that. The Egyptians. But they walked through in dry land, saw that, and very soonly they're complaining. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's look at the six things it talks about that we had in Egypt. And then they made a God of their own. And of course, I love Aaron's apology to God. Even though he had made it, he said, I don't know, it just, this thing just formed, and all of a sudden there was this thing here. So we're all making excuses. But anyways, the last time it's used in the Old Testament is go to Zechariah. And of course, Zechariah is a, a book of prophecy talking about the day of the Lord and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you look in Zechariah 12, 12, I hope I have the right verse. Yes. Uh, if somebody will read verse 10, please, I'll appreciate it of Zechariah 12. See now how that fits into the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are they that mourn, so they should be comforted. People don't even understand that when that will happen will be at the second coming. And that's why at the Sermon on the Mount, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ went up on a mountain, which is a symbol of the kingdom. And he sat, which is what a king does. And when he's sitting on that throne of David, all these blessings of the Sermon on the Mount are going to be given to Israel. It has nothing to do with you and I. But anyways, that's the last time it's used in the Old Testament. Now, what we have to find out and what is true is there is absolute proof. It's overwhelming that the secret of God's eternal purpose and good news to mankind was given to the Apostle Paul. And we're going to look at it. And there's only two verses that if people would look at and really believe, they wouldn't even have to go any further. And the first one is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. If, let's go to that, please. Ephesians 3, 2. And we all know this. Ephesians 1, uh, Ephesians 1 through 10 is a phenomenal passage that we could look at just in those 10 verses and probably spend a whole year on. But look at Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given me and the twelve to you word. Oh, did I add something to the Word of God there? 
Did I? Okay. Doesn't say 12, does it? Okay. He's very specific, you know. People would say, boy, Paul has an ego. 1,000 times in his epistles, he used the word, I, me, my, mine. But it's all about his ministry. It's not that this ego about him as a person. But you can't find this anywhere else. So even in that one simple verse, people should realize and say there is something unique about Paul's ministry. Because he says, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you. But look at the verse right before it. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for what? For you Gentiles. Eighteen times in Paul's epistles, he says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I am a preacher of the Gentiles. I am a teacher of the Gentiles. I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. I am a witness to the Gentiles. I am a minister of the Gentiles. No other writer says that. Peter never says that to the church that looks at him as being the first pope, and then there's this succession. He never says that. He says very, very clearly, it says in Galatians when they had a meeting, Peter was given what? The ministry to the circumcision. Paul was given this special revelation to Gentiles. So 18 times Paul is emphasizing that point about what he was given by the Lord Jesus Christ to go to the Gentiles. The second verse that we could do, so just in these two verses, if somebody would be truly unbiased, which most people are not because they have all their traditions. They would just look at Ephesians 3, 2 and go back to Acts 20, 24 and they would say there has to be something different and unique about Paul's ministry. Because in Acts 20, 24 everybody follow along please. We're going to go very slow in this. But none of these things move me. He's talking about all that he's going through, all the sufferings that he is going through for this man. Neither count I my, li my life dear unto myself. So that, first of all, what's he doing? He says, I must or I might finish my course. If we go to 2 Timothy, he says, I have finished my course. I've done everything that God wanted me to do. I'm going to die now from this ministry. But here... In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, he says, I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, here's a key, which I have received of the Lord Jesus. I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify what? The gospel, the, gospel of the grace of God. This is the first time in Scripture that term is used. You can't find it anywhere else in the book of Acts up to Acts 20. Peter had the gospel of the kingdom. But Paul says something so unique. I have the gospel of the grace of God, and I have been given the dispensation of the grace of God. So if somebody would really be unbiased and look at this message, they'd say, that's the only two verses I know, that there's something totally unique about Paul's ministry that wasn't true about when the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we talk about the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry, we're not talking about him as God. We're not going to talk about the second part of the Godhead. We're talking about the, when he was made lower than the angels, according to Hebrews, he came down with a ministry, and he makes it very clear, my ministry is only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in Paul, in, in Romans 15, 8, says that Christ had this ministry to the circumcision to fulfill the promises made unto the fathers. And that's what all the prophets, of course, have talked about. But Paul's the first one that uses this term, the gospel of the grace of God, and the only one that ever says, I've been given the dispensation of the grace of God. So in light of that, today what we're going to do is just look at, if, even we, if we get over it, these great truths, we're going to look at this part, okay? The dispensation of grace and what it includes, which is amazing. So we're going to use a lot of verses. I hope everybody enjoys doing that. But Paul begins then the proclamation of grace. Others before him speak of grace? Absolutely. We showed that. We showed that in Noah. 
We showed that with Israel that they had grace. It's always about God's grace. It's God's grace through faith in any dispensation. You can't be saved any other way. But no one, again, I'm going to emphasize, talks about the dispensation of the grace of God or the gospel of the grace of God. So when we look at that, it's not just Paul, but the inspired word of God that tells us, that declares that this dispensation of grace of God was given to one man, to the Apostle Paul. It was his ministry, it was received of the Lord Jesus. So in light of that, I want to look at all the verses, and I must have gone. So give me a minute here, please. Yes. <laughs> so hopefully, give me one minute here. And okay, go to Romans chapter 3. I found it. it. Took me a minute. In Romans chapter 3, we're going to look about all the different things that Paul talks about the grace has been given to you and I. So the first verses we all know. Go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. And if somebody would read that verse, please. So we're looking at the first part. We'll look at the second part about the redemption of Jesus Christ because that has to do with the preaching of the cross. But the first thing we understand is that Paul very clear in that verse says, you and I are justified, and how? Freely. I love that word. Freely by the, gra by the grace of God, by God's grace. Justified is simply another word for righteousness. You and I have been given the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ freely because of God's grace. So that's a wonderful place to start. Now, go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, and if somebody would read that place. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In a sense, it's almost like in the second part he says, Sin did abound, but grace superabounded. Oh, where sin was, I love that. Read it again, Dale. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So we understand a little bit about the law there, and we understand about sin, but the thing is, overwhelmingly, the last part of that, which is so amazing in that turn, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 5 uses the term much more five different times, much more, much more, much more, talking about what we have in Christ. Now, but what is the reason? Why does he say that verse? Why does he give it that information? Well, he has to have a conclusion to that, and that's in verse 21. If somebody will read that, please. That's the key. Why, did, where sin abounded, did grace have to abound? The answer is very simply, what? That grace may, what? Reign through eternal life. That's the key. This was all given that uh, you can't understand 520 unless you also see 521. That's the context. The key is that grace might reign. No other writer says that. I mean, think about that reigning. We understand that. That's royalty. That's king. That's sitting on a throne. That's doing it. But that's what you and I have, that grace might reign. This was all done because we can't save ourselves. Sin was going to put us in a situation that all of us had to be judged. All of us would have been sent to hell. We had no other choice except to be punished. But in God's wonderful grace, he said, I did this all for you. The grace may superabound beyond what sin has done for you and I. And that should affect our lives. All these verses should affect our lives. It may not. But the key is that grace may reign. Go to Romans chapter 6 and 14, and you're going to have a, ver a thing that you can't find anywhere else in Scripture. Peter won't say this. Christ never said this when he was in the earth. The prophets never said this. So very quickly, read Romans 6, 14, please. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, 
why this is so important is because everybody likes the book of Psalms. People are always talking about how they use it in their devotional. And it is. Psalms is wonderful. But Psalms is given to a specific nation. The other thing that people don't realize is Psalms is a book of prophecy, just like every other book. It's not just a devotional book. And what is amazing is, if you'll go back to Psalms chapter 2, this wonderful book that everybody likes to use, and it is a wonderful book to read, and you can get a lot, but it's also, you have to understand it, in a sense of prophecy. But if you go to Psalms chapter 1, I'm sorry, and look at, amazingly, the difference of what Psalms starts out with in verse 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Wow. Hmm. Is Paul going to have to say, is Paul going to say something about the ungodly? When we were without strength, die, Christ died for the ungodly? That seems like a, a totally different thing. The, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, when we were sinners, Christ did what? Died for us. Doesn't seem that says that either, does it? Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But here's the key. But his delight is in the grace of the Lord. Oh, did I make a mistake again? Well, please correct me when I do. All right. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate what? Day and night. Wow. So it seems like this wonderful book of Psalms, not talking much about grace, is it? It's talking about law. And it's just the opposite of what Paul says about the ungodly and sinners. So the beautiful thing about that, Psalms is a wonderful book, but you have to take it in perspective of who he's talking to. He's talking to a nation. David's Psalms are to a nation as a king. And it's all about the law that God had given them. Now we understand the proof of the law was given to Israel not to prove they could keep it, but to prove just the opposite, that they could not keep it, that no man could keep it. To somebody that says, well, I live by the Ten Commandments. I try to follow it. But the problem is Christ emphasized that it's not even doing it, is it? He said, if you've thought it in your mind, you've already done it. If you thought adultery in your mind, it's already been done. If you thought murder in your heart, you've already done it. So, but that's just to take you back to Psalms. Okay, let's continue now. And I love this next verse. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this also helps us to, that once we have and be given this wonderful grace that God has given to us, then there is, this grace is actually an, av an, av yeah. Woo. an avenue, <laughs> I can get it out here, to show us then how we can have the good works that's related to us. Because to those people say, oh, you're those people. Say, once saved, always saved. Can't lose your salvation. Absolutely true. But the emphasis is not just that we have this wonderful grace given us as a gift, but it's then what we are supposed to do with this grace. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And look at verse 8 as I read, please. And God is able to make all grace abound, there's that word abound again, towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things, may what? Abound to every good work. Paul doesn't leave us where people says that. Now that's a choice we make. And it is so easy to do what they tell us. It is absolutely, I'm going to talk about myself, you talk about yourself. It is so easy to follow your flesh. So easy saying, I can't lose my salvation. I can't. But the answer has to be, if God did this wonderful thing for me, then what should I do in Christ? What should I do that I have the righteousness of God in Christ? What is it? And this verse helps it. It said, we've been given that grace. It's been abounding toward us. For a simple reason, that in all sufficiency, in all things, may abound to every good work. That's a choice we're going to make. And that's where the rewards come in, of course. And God will make that choice. He'll know whether they burn up or whether they're going to be that reward that will have a position. And positions is what it's always about. 
So what a wonderful verse that is. Now, so when we think about it, next, what was God's purpose? What was God's purpose? What does Paul tell us? And that's the key about what his purpose is in that grace. And all we have to do is go to, to Ephesians. If he's given all these wonderful things, if we have been justified, if we've been given this wonderful thing of eternal life and the righteousness of God in Christ, all by the grace of God and all by the second aspect because of the preaching of the cross and what Christ did for us, of course, in the cross. But if he did that then, what is his ultimate purpose at the end of this for you and I? Go to Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. Again, I apologize for being slow with this new Bible. But when we get to Ephesians 2, 7, I would like somebody to read that verse, please. Ephesians 2 and verse 7, please. Isn't that amazing? God has a purpose. And his purpose very clearly says, I've done all of this. And remember I said to you before, Ephesians is six little chapters. Six. If you might put it that way. And grace is mentioned 12 times. Ephesians is absolutely, all of them are the book of grace. 12 times in six little chapters, grace is mentioned. Grace, 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 grace. It's all about grace. And yet in all the four gospels, you can only find the word grace five times. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one time, and it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, how he grew, but never about salvation. Peter never talks about the grace of God and salvation at Pentecost. It's amazing to me when people and all our fundamentals, brother, and I love them, want to start the church of Pentecost. Paul is, I mean, Peter is so clear this, that he says at Pentecost, what's it all about? This is that which what Joel was talking about. And if you go back to the book of Joel, as we know, it's always talking about, he, who is he talking to? The inhabitants of the land. The inhabitants of the land. The ha what land? The land of Israel. And it's all about the day of the Lord. It's not about this wonderful grace period that we have. So in light of that, later on, if you go to the book of Peter, and we'll look at that later on, he does talk about grace. But I look at it very clearly that Peter grew as he learned Paul's message. And that's what Galatians was all about. And, and, and uh, when they had that conference, when he said, Paul says they had nothing to add to me, the 12, but I had much to add to them. I told them that gospel, which I preached among the Gentiles. Did you ever think about that? And I'm sort of going off track here, but that's all right. We have time. If there's one gospel, as they tell us, why would it be necessary for Paul, by revelation, to go up, if you look at Galatians 2, go by revelation from Christ to show them the gospel that he taught among the Gentiles, if it's what? The same gospel. It makes no sense. I don't have to go up. We're all preaching the same gospel. But it's not, no, it's not all the same gospel. So it's amazing. people don't want to really study Scripture. They just want to read it as a devotional. But that, that's so important. So now we know the purpose. At that wonderful time in his kindness, he's going to show that grace to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's only because we're in Christ. Now, but what we have to look at also is we can look at the book of Acts. And I said this to you before, and again, this is what study is all about. If you go and you get to Acts 15, and Acts 15 is that conference they had in Galatians chapter 2. And when you go to that conference, at that time, from that time forward in Acts 15 to the rest of Acts, you'll never hear Peter's name mentioned. Paul's name is mentioned, and I could be wrong in my count, 132 times. And the only other people mentioned from Acts 15 all the way to the end of Acts is those people who dealt with Paul. There's no other conversation of anybody else in the rest of the book except Paul and those that dealt with Paul. That's significant. And when Paul goes to, uh, to Jerusalem the last time in Acts 21, he speaks to James. It seems like James, the brother of Christ, is now in charge. 
Now, I don't know it's whether Peter has died at that time. It doesn't tell us. But the point is, James is the one speaking. Peter's not even speaking. He's going to see James. But the first time he goes to Jerusalem, he tells us in Galatians 2, I went to see Peter. But now it's James he's talking to. But that has to be significant. There's such a change because Peter dominates the first part of Acts when God's dealing with him. And the power that he had that was given by the Holy Spirit. And there's another thing that we'll study, maybe if we get a chance to do. It was very important that they had to understand that Paul had the same signs and ability and miracles that Peter and the Twelve had. If we look at Scripture, Paul will duplicate everything that Peter did. Peter raised some from the dead. Paul raised some from the dead. Peter was re released magically from the jail. Paul was released magically at that time from the jail. Paul killed, uh, healed somebody who was of an incurable disease. Peter did the same thing. So you'll see that Paul duplicates every single sign. But once you get to the book of Acts, signs are done. Once he says for the third time we turn to the Gentiles, you will not see those miracles performed by Paul again in any of the prison epistles. Very important. But when he's still dealing with Israel, at that time, Paul had to have the ability to also see, have signs, and we'll see that in just a minute. So when we look at the book of Acts, go to Acts 13. We'll not get to get as far as I go, but we're not rushed, right? It's not snowing, and it won't be snowing for months. So. <laughs> so in Acts chapter 13 is something so amazing. And this is the first time that this is ever said in a book of Acts 2, and it's said by our apostle. Somebody read verses 38 and 39, please, of Acts 13. Why is that important? You will never see Peter say that. You'll never see Christ say that in his earthly ministry. You'll never see that. That's the first time in all of Scripture you see that. And by him all that believe are justified, made righteous, declared righteous from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. First time we have that in Scripture. But then go to verse 43, please. Because notice the significance here. Now when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue what? In the grace of God. Do you find that at Pentecost? Absolutely not. At Pentecost, Peter is preaching the same thing that John did. And he accuses them. He doesn't say anything wonderful about the cross. He calls it a shameful thing what Israel did at the cross. You killed him with wicked hands. Peter, we believe you. What should we do? Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same gift that they had of power to be able to do what Peter did, that when Peter said, silver and gold I have an unto a person who had never walked, but what I have to give to you, rise up and walk. And that person leaped into the temple. And that is an actual occurrence, but also a picture of Israel. It's a picture of Israel, wounded, healed, cannot walk. And what it's going to be like in the kingdom, that he leaped into that temple, totally whole. Not just of one thing, oh, I have headaches and God's going to now heal me, but I still have arthritis in my knees, which I do. That one change when every time it says they were made whole and they would have gone into the kingdom whole if that kingdom would have come and that kingdom was so close that they would have only had to wait seven years going through that time of tribulation and that's why Christ said many of you who are standing here will not die till you see the Lord Jesus Christ coming he wasn't lying he was talking about simply the kingdom program at that time with Israel so very clearly Look at Acts chapter 14 and verse 3 now. This is when Barnabas and Paul are going to be sent out and separated. This Acts 14 is a very important thing. And look at verse 3, please, if somebody will read that. And 
And do you see why I emphasize that verse? Because people say, see, Paul t- did signs and wonders and miracles. Absolutely. But he's still dealing with Israel because every time that you will see Paul in the book of Acts go into a city, the first thing he did was go into a synagogue. And he preached Jesus Christ as Messiah, the one that has been raised by God from the dead. And so therefore, what would Israel require for Paul, for them to look at Paul's apostle? Signs. He would have to do those same signs that Peter did, or they wouldn't have accepted him. And would the 12 have accepted him? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He had to perform that signs. That's why I said he duplicated everything. We may look at that in the next weeks as we turn. Everything that Peter did. This word of God is so wonderful, so precious, and so true. But if, if we have our King James Bible, that's the only Bible we can count on. I was terrible, I told you. The worst subject I ever had was foreign languages. And back when I was in school, you had to do two years of a foreign language to get into college. I suffered through it. I absolutely did. I am terrible. I'm amazed when they say somebody speaks five languages, because <laughs> there's no way. So I'm just thankful. So I am so glad I have a Bible I can trust on, because if I had to count on the Greek and Hebrew and look into it, I'd be totally lost. And somebody else would be up here teaching. But I can count on a Bible that God gave us for English-speaking people that I can look at in English and say, I don't have to worry about the Greek or the Hebrew. I know this is God's word to us. So as we continue, and we're going to close with this, and we'll continue next week, is look at Acts 15, 11. And this is where we're going to close. And this is a key verse, because it's Peter who's saying it. But I want to emphasize something that is very important. And I did this in a, a study before. Somebody read Acts 15, 11, and please listen to it very carefully. Bob, please read this slowly. Now, there's two things I'm going to emphasize. That's Peter. But the key is, did he say that at Pentecost? Absolutely not. He said nothing about that. The second thing I must emphasize is is what he's saying there. Now, let's look at it closely. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as what? They. So, yes. But if you go back to Acts 10 when he's dealing with Cornelius at that time, he changes it. totally up. He says that they Gentiles may be saved as us. Now he's saying that we may be saved as they. Putting the emphasis that the Gentiles have a first, we now can have that same grace. But if you look at Cornelius, when he says that to him, it's that, oh, God has no respect to a person. He says, so therefore they Gentiles are going to be saved by us. And then the next thing he says is, if they do works of righteousness, that would be doing of the law. And we know what Titus says, it's not by works of righteousness we do, but through God's mercy he saved us. So we will continue this next week. I didn't get as far, but that's all right. I'm sorry, Tammy, yes. No, I don't think, yeah, there's, uh, that's a big contrast. I don't think that anybody, Peter and them, are in the body of Christ. There are some that do that, that they say now they're in the body. But he's just, I think Paul has emphasized to them that if they, as Israel, would have looked back into the verses we looked, where he says that Israel found grace in the wilderness, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, Zechariah, we didn't look at that verse, found grace. I think that's the purpose that Peter said, wait, it is about always about God's grace. We can't keep the law. So therefore, it has to be by grace, if that helps Tammy. No, I, I didn't mean to keep you in the talk. Oh. I mean, from this point on, anyone that believes, right, right there at that point in time, I believe that. I believe that from then on, Jews, because the kingdom cannot be given to them America, so everyone that Paul is dealing from there so as Jews, absolutely, that's my opinion. I could be wrong. That now they are now Paul. Because remember what he, uh, James says. We understand that you are telling the Jews when you're going out, Paul, that what? You don't have to keep the law of Moses. You don't have to do that. And he said, we're all zealous of the law because there. 
And Paul was doing that. That's exactly what he was doing at that time. And I think he took that vow of the Nazarene, and that's why God did not allow him to finish that vow. If you look at it, they were going to kill him, and he wasn't there because they said that he had brought Gentiles into the temple. But a very good point, but I agree with you. From that time forward, when Paul's talking to the Jews, those Jews that Paul's going to give that message of salvation would be Jew and Gentile alike, all in the body of Christ. Good point. Okay, Father, we are so thankful for your word and thankful for, to see that first wonderful verse that Paul says, justified freely by God's grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. We'll be looking at that preaching of the cross later. We'll still look at a little bit of grace. But we just thank you and praise you for this wonderful word and this wonderful apostle that you called out, that you chose to bring this wonderful message of grace and no one emphasizes the Lord Jesus Christ more than our Apostle Paul. We just thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.